my role, oh, sorry. In my role as a reference librarian here at Baker, I am part of the core team for exhibits. Um, the staff that we bring in sometimes changes based upon the topic, but I always play some role. And in terms for this page, it was organizing the text in the images that the curator of our exhibit picked and figuring out how to present them on Spotlight. It was our first time really using Spotlight um, in, in depth. We have another site, but it is very basic, like a lot of the other Harvard sites that are more concerned about presenting the digitized content as opposed to presenting supplementary material along with it if you wanted to do more in-depth research. So we didn't have a lot of like internal resources to like help us or to go to for advice to say like, how did you build this page? How did you make it look like this? Um, that's not to say that Vanessa wasn't like a tremendous help. She, you know, she taught us how Spotlight works. She talked to us about the, like the limitations of the instance that's at Harvard. She worked with us to think about like workarounds that if we can't do something, you know, maybe you can do it this way. So she was really very helpful to us. Um, so in normal times when we do exhibits, it normally has three components. There's like a physical display in our library and there's a printed catalog and then there's the website. But during these times, the website obviously takes on much more importance. So we wanted everything to be on there. <coughs> so we also wanted to make sure that the site that we we're building could like kind of stand along some of the sites that we built in the past with um, people that are more experienced building websites. So we wanted our site to like look nice, <laughs> basically, that it could stand along with the other ones. So if you could see by looking at this is that we very much relied on the thumbnails to call out certain pages. And we focused more on calling out areas like essays that people had written, a timeline, a re review of selected prints before we went right into, you know, just browse all the items. And going into a page here, when we were building the pages, one of the first things that came up that we would have loved to have more control of was just formatting, whether that was the size of the text, the amount of space that was between widgets, even things like being able to do like superscript would have been great for footnotes. We, we found a way around it by just putting things in brackets and creating links. Um, the other thing that we learned is that the more content that you can upload beforehand, the better. The exhibit item widgets obviously have a little bit more bells and whistles than the standard widgets. But just because um, our current work situation, a lot of us are working offsite and we needed the site to launch at a certain time we had to like upload single scans. So we kind of like had to make do with what we had. So in this case, um, the title here is digitized, but the digitized title is from microfilm. So it doesn't look pretty. So we used Photoshop to create like a better looking image and we updated it. I mean, we uploaded it as a single image, but again, there was a lot of playing around like to get the right size. Um, and then we were saying it would have been great if they could be more free floating, that it didn't have to have the box around it. But then once you upload a single image, you notice that there's no way to interact with it. You can't zoom in, you can't zoom out. And it's probably not obvious to the researcher that the title is digitized in full. So in our case, what we did is that we updated the text a little bit. Instead of saying things like this title or this item, we actually work the title into the text. So when you click on it, it goes to the digitized title. Um, and as you'll see, like this is what the original front page looked like. Perfectly good if you just wanna read the title not that pretty looking for an exhibit page. <laughs> um, and then you'll see like throughout this page how a lot of times we, we struggled with or trying to figure out how to upload single images. What we found when uploading single images is that, and using the standard widgets is that horizontal images seem to work better than, you know, vertical images. Um, in some cases, like these are original documents, it would have been great to be able to see them in more detail, but in order to see them in detail, it would have had to have been very large. So we tried to work around that some by creating more detailed captions. Um, and then the other thing that would have been great is that usually our sites have some sort of like arrow or some sort of like graphic that has you go previous and next, but that's not something that's currently available in the Harvard instance. But we did find something from, I think it was the University of Victoria. We have that code and we hope to be able to like implement that maybe in some future version of Harvard's, Harvard's instance. But overall, I think it was just a really good project. We like we learned a lot. It's great to be able to have control about what we're presenting. We've 
gotten good feedback about how, how the site looks. And I think we'd definitely use it in the future. Does anybody have any questions? Because I can turn it over to Heather and she can talk specifically about um, certain tools that we use to embed things to re, um, review the print and for a timeline. Absolutely. Um, so before I um, share my screen um, to uh, walk you through both the timeline that we created and ArcGIS story map and the, um, the, uh, the exploration of the iconography of selected prints that we did using um, the Neatline plugin in Omeka, I, I did want to talk a little bit about our experience um, trying to find tools that could create more interactive elements in a curiosity exhibit. So as Melissa mentioned, we um, typically work with a, a, a group of web designers and graphic designers to uh, put together our uh, ex exhibition websites. However, uh, we had more limited funding for this particular project. So we really wanted to utilize the resources available to us through Harvard. Uh, I spent a few months looking into um, options that could be embedded into Curiosity, um, including uh, Google Arts in College, um, Night Labs, um, Story Map JS, as well as Timeline JS features, um, as well as uh, some more commercial products like Visme and Adobe Spark that allow you to create um, um, really sleek looking presentations, but we had concerns about the fact that they were commercial products. So we really narrowed it down to um, nonprofit um, educational products that uh, we felt uh, may, uh, may last a little longer, be more stable, given that we, we hoped this exhibit would last for quite a few years on our on um, Curiosity. And uh, for that reason, we ended up selecting Omeka and ArcGIS because they are Harvard Library supported. And we were able to put all of our files um, into systems that um, we know that Harvard Library is maintaining, um, which was very important to us as part of this. So let me go ahead and share my screen and show you what we did uh, both for the timeline and the iconography of prints. Um, so you can see here, this is the, um, the timeline section of our website, which is uh, a ArcGIS story map. Um, again, I, I actually just um, really uh, explored ArcGIS because of um, Stanford's use of it. Uh, but this is a very simple uh, story map in that it is um, you know, text and images inserted. There are, there's a lot of great additional functionality that I considered using for uh, both the timeline and the iconography of prints. Um, there's a sidecar feature in which, uh, which I believe Stanford used extensively that would allow you to open, um, that would allow you to scroll um, past uh, so have text that scrolls past a more constant image. However, because of the nature of our timeline in which we had uh, images that were really directly tied to dates uh, that we decided not to use that. And also the fact that we did not have an image tied to every date in our timeline, we could not use the slideshow functionality. Um, that being said, I think there is a lot of flexibility with ArcGIS um, to use it um, for many different purposes. Uh, and we happen to use it for a more text-based um, feature, but I think the ability to explore um, the space is, is a really wonderful feature of it and obviously the reason it was created. Um, but to point out just a few elements of creating this, um, you can see in my other tab, which is actually the timeline in ArcGIS itself. Um, and let me go ahead and hide my control panel so I can see this a little bit better. Um, there were, we experienced some issues in creating the site that I think it might've just been user error or, or um, the fact that I am a novice with the system, um, which were issues with spacing. Um, so you can see here, even in this, um, the, the dates that we have at the top, there are some issues with spacing um, in that the way I needed to space the entries out in order for it, them to display correctly 
when embedded in curiosity meant I had to um, space them out in, in in some cases, very um, unintuitive ways, actually in ArcGIS. And you can see the ramifications of that in the, um, the entries at the top. But I, I just wanted to ensure that every inch entry um, displayed on its own line, whether or not it had a, an associated image with it. And then when I actually went to embed it into the site itself, um, and this is something that I experienced both with embedding ArcGIS as well as embedding Omeka, is needing to play around with the, um, the sizing of the embed. And in this case, I wanted the embed to be essentially the entire width of the screen so that when you begin to scroll down the page, you are essentially um, you're always scrolling within the embed, within that iframe, as opposed to um, perhaps potentially getting caught outside of it and not being able to, to scroll. So that was our experience with ArcGIS. And then we also um, used Omeka's Neatline, which as I mentioned, um, we uh, decided on really the most important um, element of that decision was that all of the uh, files that I would be uploading to enter into the, um, to use for this project, uh, would be hosted on Amazon's um, AWS. So uh, I will say that it was between uh, Omeka and um, the Night Labs Story Map JS, which I have an example of, I just wanted to show everyone. Um, and a very important element of the iconography for our curator was that it not be linear. Um, she really wanted people to be able to move around a print freely and not move around a print in a specified uh, order. And so I really liked a lot of the functionality of the, um, the Story Maps JS. However, um, you need incredibly large files to do this. Um, I, I went back and forth with uh, one of the representatives at Night Labs and we simply couldn't get files large enough with our scanners in house to even uh, attempt uh, to use StoryMap.js. So while it did, it I think it um, has some great functionality. Um, it it just wasn't going to work for our project. But I have seen it in, embedded in other sites, and I, I thought it was a good potential option. So with the uh, Neatline plugin in Omeka, you're able to essentially map. Uh, whether it be uh, on an actual map or in our case on an image um, and uh, put in entries where you can include both text and, uh, and an image to really zoom in on different portions of um, the print. So um, we liked that it allowed you to move around. You can zoom in to the print to get more detail. Um, whoop. I zoomed in on the whole page, um, but you can also move the print around depending on the size of your screen. And um, there is a lot of flexibility and a lot of options with what you can do in terms of how you um, denote the different areas of a print that you want to call out. So we did this for three different prints, um, and we they are different. They were different sizes and. Um, it did involve having to play around quite a bit um, on when uploading the files. You have to upload them at an appropriate size to um, enable it to display at a high enough resolution um, while embedded on Curiosity um, without um, overtaking half, half of the page. That was a really big concern for us is wanting it to be um, visible and usable on a wide variety of screens, um, knowing that it might not be the most responsive we also do have some um, additional concerns about the accessibility of a project like this and that it's, it's more difficult to, to use um, accessibility um, tools and, and screen readers. Um, so we do also plan on uploading uh, essentially a um, more static version of the prints with all of the um, additional that you see when you click on the individual elements um, called out. Um, so that will, that will be generated using one of the tools, most likely using one of the tools that we had thought about using um, something like Adobe Spark um, because we can export it and um, really save it in a, um, 
in a defined format that, that won't um, need to change over time. So that is, um, it, it was a really great experience going through and um, learning more about these tools. And especially, I'm um, very grateful for all of the tools that are available through Harvard Library and through um, Harvard University, the different systems that we can we have available to us. So while Omeka is um, supported by academic technology and is typically used for courses, um, they were more than happy to allow us to, to set up an account um, to use it specifically for a library project. Does anybody have any questions about the tools we selected or the process? If no one has any questions, I, I, I would love to just jump in and say thank you so much to Melissa and Heather. And, um, and, and I will just say from my perspective as the service manager, it was so helpful to hear from them as they were building the site. Um, you, you know, all of the things that they wanted to see Spotlight do and how how we could make it work within our current um, environment. And um, it was just so great to get some feedback because as Melissa mentioned, a lot of the sites we have at Harvard are pretty simple. People seem to tend to really want to use Spotlight for the searching and browsing capabilities and don't necessarily always have the time to like build out all these pages. So for me, it was like a real learning experience to actually have some um, exhibit uh, creators that, re that really wanted to take advantage of all that Spotlight has to offer. Um, so that was just awesome. And they actually really inspired me to wanna learn more about, well, what tools can we embed in Spotlight? What is out there? What's the community using? Um, and so, um, and 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 so, I I've done some more research on my own, and and it's wonderful to see that you know you came across a lot of the same tools I came across, and and I like that your focus was to finding tools that were supported within Harvard too, because that's always the the tricky thing with when you're embedding something, you don't know what's going to happen to that tool in the future. So I think that was really smart to, to have an eye on that. Um, and one question I had was, um, it sounded like you explored the timeline, the J, the, the what is it, night? The night labs from Northwestern. Yeah, night lab. Yeah, I was curious, uh, what were your thoughts on timeline JS as opposed to the Omeco uh, timeline? I, um, I presented timeline JS as another option to the exhibition committee and they, and I think because there is, there are some elements of timeline JS that you might say are a little bit more dated. They liked the um, just the presentation of the ArcGIS timeline a bit more. I think that there are a lot of uh, great features in the timeline JS, um, and but uh, our curator was also very interested in it being a vertical presentation as opposed to a horizontal presentation. And timeline JS is is very much um, horizontally focused. Makes sense. I think we have time for one more question if there is one. I, I don't have a question, Kathy, but I, if I could make a quick um, comment on- I hope, I hope you're gonna talk about what I think you're gonna talk about, yes. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, I'm not sure. I just going back to uh, what Melissa demoed um, I just want to point out, Melissa, you mentioned a couple of times about the, uh, the inability to see uploaded items that were embedded in the page, you know, any larger. Um, and I just want to point out, we, there is a ticket for that, a GitHub ticket um, to, to make that um, the uploaded item um, available um, in, a, in a larger, um, what we call a zipper window. Uh, a little modal where you can zoom pan. Um, so that's an existing tipic, uh, ticket that is kind of in our priorities. It's not real high in our priorities at Stanford, but you know we we I hope we get to it. Um, so I just want to point out that that has been identified as a as a feature that we need to add. Um, 
and, and, and then sort of just a, a comment in general, I know most of the people on this call are not developers, but just to keep in mind, passing on the message to developers, when you see something like that, like just keep in mind that um, we would love to get community, um, get pull requests from other people outside of Stanford to improve things like that. Um, because all of the things that, uh, you know, that have been mentioned as sort of limitations um, in the demos are, are things that we at Stanford also think are limitations and we just don't have the bandwidth to, to improve them. So, uh, and one final comment real quick. Um, I just wanna say, I, I, I really enjoy seeing these um, in the last two presentations, all the examples of uh, embedded sort of pre uh, embedded things within feature pages. Cause I wanna point out that the, the library you use for widgets, or Trevor is called, this library that, that sort of controls when you edit a feature page um, or the home page, um, and you have that selection of, of widgets, it's very limiting. It's, and it's, and it, it's, it's really hard to add new widgets. There's, there's a lot of work that goes involved in, in setting up the configuration and all that kind of stuff. And some of the, the examples you all showed were are pretty complex to set up. And so they're really not feasible within uh, uh, spotlight to do it directly in spotlight. And so I, I think I, I'm, I'm particularly interested in seeing more and more of these examples of what things can we configure outside of spotlight and then work on how we can like do the best job of integrating them once you embed them in a spotlight page to kind of make them feel, you know, seamlessly embedded. Um, so anyway, just thanks for, for showing these examples. I, I enjoy it. Yeah, Gary, that's a really great point. And I think like right now, Harvard, we're, we're working on um, upgrading our IIIF infrastructure. And I the hope there is that we're gonna get to a point where people could upload images in that environment and then take advantage of hopefully as the IIIF community um, makes more tools like this. Like, I think that's a great chance to sort of have like a you know maybe a community created tool but mm -hmm. images served on the Harvard environment kind of situation yep. um, but you know we're we're a, a bit away from that so um, no but you're totally right Vanessa I've been thinking the same thing the last six months or so I've just in the triple IF world there's been so many you know more examples coming up with little things like this and so I, I totally agree with you that the the future looks good for for um, new tools coming out of the, the triple IF world. For sure. Yeah. Oh, and, and if I could add to, since you brought up the upload um, widget, a lot of folks also want to be able to, for that image to be linkable to something else. Is that in, in your uh, yeah, that? Me... You know, we can follow up elsewhere, but I, I will also say whenever Harvard, whenever I can get some development time, I would love to be able to coordinate with you all and figure out, you know, what we can do to, to develop things and, and, and push it back to the core. Yeah, and, and, and just to, to make clear, I, sometimes I think maybe if a developer at, at an institution has done something custom, there may be a hurdle there where especially if it involves like configuration or something like that. And maybe you don't have a designer on the team to think about that. I would be, I, I think you, it, it'd be great to still create a ticket in the repo, say, you know, we have this idea for a feature. We've actually made it work locally. We can't really make a pull request for it because it needs some UI or something like that. I would be happy to help, you know, work on that, you know, with you. But um, the really, we're definitely super open to getting pull requests and, and working with you to, to, to get them into the, the spot like base code because then it benefits everybody. Yep. That sounds great. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording and then we can continue discussing. So.